Uh, today I think we have a, a very special uh, physics colloquium and we're going to hear about the physics and the astrophysics of black holes. Now in case you were wondering, I always grew up thinking that black holes were supposedly the simplest objects in the universe, but it turns out they're also not well understood. So uh, I think we're going to hear more about that today. They exist over an enormous range of mass scales, something of order 10 orders of magnitude. And, sorry? Oh, microphone. Uh, okay, sorry about that. My voice is red shifted because I'm very close to it. Okay, we'll start over. All right, so as I was saying, we're going to hear today about the physics and astrophysics of black holes. These are supposedly the simplest objects in the universe, but in fact they're not well understood in a number of ways. They exist over an enormous range of mass scale, and there are outstanding questions about how they form, how they evolve, and their role in the evolution and formation of the universe that we observe. Now fortunately, we have two leading experts who are going to reveal to us all the secrets that they know about black holes. Uh, so Roger Blanford is, in fact, the Luke Blossom Professor in the School of Humanities and Sciences here at Stanford. He's also a professor of physics and of particle physics and astrophysics at the SLAC National Accelerator Laboratory. Roger came to Stanford from Caltech, where he was the Richard Chase Tolman Professor of Theoretical Astrophysics. And in 2003, he came to Stanford as the founding director of the Cottle Institute of Particle Astrophysics and Cosmology. Roger is widely recognized for his important contributions to the study of black holes. His many achievements include figuring out a practical, at least for nature, a practical way to actually extract energy from a rotating black hole. Roger is a member of the Royal Society, the Royal Astronomical Society, the National Academy of Sciences, and the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He has received a num numerous awards for his work, recognition, including the Eddington Medal and the Gold Medal of the Royal Astronomical Society. Most recently, he shared with Roy Kerr and also Yaakov Oli Ashberg from the Mathematics Department here at Stanford. They shared the 2016 Crawford Prize for Mathematics and Astronomy awarded by the Swedish Royal Academy. So our other speaker today is Eva Silverstein, is professor of physics here at Stanford. Much of Eva's research and she'll correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, is focused on understanding what the basic degrees of freedom and interactions are that underlie gravitational and particle physics and addressing foundational questions such as what are the mechanisms behind the initial seeds of structure in the universe and how can we explore these mechanisms using cosmological observations. Her research addresses questions of quantum gravity including the physics of black holes and cosmological horizons. <coughs> Eva joined the faculty at Stanford as assistant professor at the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center in 1997. And since 2006, Eva has been professor of physics as well as a member of the Stanford Institute of Theoretical Physics. Eva's outstanding research has been recognized with a number of awards, including the MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, the MacArthur Genius Award, as it's sometimes called, in 1999, the Bergman Memorial Award of the Israel-U.S. Binational Science Foundations in 2006, and most recently, Eva was recognized as a Simons Foundation investigator and currently directs the Modern Inflationary Cosmology Collaboration with the Simons Foundation Origins of the Universe Initiative. So, very exciting work. Eva will now begin, followed by Roger, and then we're going to have time for discussion. So we're going to sort of have 20, 20, and 20. So I'll turn this over to Eva. Thank you.
Okay, well, thank you very much, Peter, for that kind introduction. Um, and as Peter said, we're going to split it up into three. Uh, this subject has a rich and beautiful history, including both thought experiments, Gedanken experiments, and real observations. And both are undergoing exciting transformations these days. Uh, especially, I would, I would say, the observations which Roger is going to speak to. So I'm going to start, um, I'm going to ultimately focus more on the thought experimental side of the subject. Um, when it comes to the observations, you'll see beautiful imagery of black holes. Uh, and having gone to astrophysics meetings, some of them jointly with Roger, I've learned that it is impossible for a humble theorist to compete with those kinds of images. So I don't, as you can see, I don't even try. Um, but I hope to get across the physics uh, through my um, more symbolic imagery. So let's start with Einstein's classical theory of gravitation, which, uh, as many of you know, consists of a set of equations that more or less take this form of energy and pressure and so on, uh, equating to curvature of space-time and vice versa. So this uh, has many manifestations, probably the most interesting and quite generic ones, which we see in our own universe, include black holes in which very dense matter curves space-time so much that there's a horizon from which even light can't escape, and cosmological uh, homogeneous energy density, the simplest form of which, simple in the sense that Peter was alluding to earlier, that it seems simple, but it's really not very simple, uh, so non-diluting constant source of energy all over the universe sources its expansion and in particular its accelerated expansion. And that also leads to horizons sequestering of different regions of space-time uh, such that different observers cannot communicate given the finite speed of light. So here are some equations and pictures that go along with those words that I just said. Uh, this is a schematic picture of a black hole. Um, in this kind of picture, one usually uh, expresses the trajectory of light as a 45 degree angle. And here you see that some observer O who's outside the black hole cannot access what is uh, inside. And in the exponentially expanding universe, because space itself is stretching exponentially, two observers who start off close by, if they just sit there, they end up unable to communicate with each other again due to the finite speed of light. Uh, let me note that this second example, uh, the energy that sources this expansion that I alluded to in the first slide, is known as the cosmological constant and it observes to be positive. Uh, we'll come back to that later. So the plan of my short part of the talk is a big picture overview where I'm going to tell you about some recent exciting developments in ultimately the sort of thought experimental side of this field. Uh, and it will be frustrating because I won't be able to explain them all in depth, but I do hope to communicate the gist of, of these. And we invite you up to SITP to visit us and talk more about the details if any of this strikes your fancy. Okay. So that was a, my first slide gave a whirlwind review of classical general relativity. I'm already going to take the quantum leap and remind you or tell you about Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle, which you probably have heard of in the form of the fact that a particle, in quantum version of particle mechanics, a particle cannot you cannot know its position and its momentum at the same time with arbitrary precision. Instead, there is an uncertainty uh, that is expressed by this inequality with a fundamental constant, Planck's constant on the right-hand side. Um, this is something that my Physics 70 students are now experts at, and I hope so are uh, many of you. Now, this applies to every quantum mechanical variable in physics, and that includes fields. So things like electromagnetic fields, um, the strength of the field uh, cannot be known with arbitrary precision along with its time derivative, along with the rate of change of the field. So it turns out that in these space times, like the black hole, 
and the accelerating universe, that basic fact about quantum physics of fields has enormous implications. In one case, for black holes, this leads to these irreducible quantum fluctuations leads to the famous Hawking radiation, uh, which indicates that black holes are not actually black, that they decay as these fluctuations in the quantum fields involve different parts of the field straddling the horizon uh, and fluctuating in a way such that the outside one can emerge from the black hole, taking away its energy and it eventually decays away. Um, one thing to note about this bringing in another aspect of quantum physics is that the state of quantum fields in this kind of situation is generically entangled, meaning if you have a couple of particles, say these two that are straddling the horizon that I sketched, there, the state of the first one is correlated with the state of the second one, uh, meaning if you measure one of them, the, you know the, the corresponding value of that observable for the other one. Um, and uh, that'll come back later as well. So for black holes, this means these black holes actually decay. Um, and there is a problem with that, a thought experimental problem with that, having to do with the fact that this effect is very so basic that the predicted radiation emerging in this way is essentially featureless. It knows about the mass of the black hole, the spin, uh, but not about whatever detailed matter it was that had originally formed the black hole in the first place. So we'll come back to that. This effect, while while undeniable <laughs> as a consequence of quantum physics and gravity is not observed in our universe. Its analog in the cosmological setting, however, is beautifully observed in the, in the universe and accounts for the origin of all structure in our observable part of the universe, in fact. This uh, irreducible fluctuation, even in a situation of accelerated expansion with no excitations to begin with, leads to a later universe with seeds for the structure that then develops through nonlinear evolution as the universe uh, evolves forward in time. So <clears throat> it's a beautiful phenomenon, both in the thought experimental and the really observable world. <clears throat> the observations in these areas are incredible and you know, getting more and more so as time goes on. Um, the first thing to say is that there are major windows of astrophysical observations involving black holes that Roger will cover shortly. Um, and at a more refined level, these systems also offer very interesting ways to test parameters of quantum fields in our universe that you know, exist and that could have existed back when these fluctuations were originally frozen in. And both in the context of black holes and in the context of these early universe uh, seeds for structure, one can use data to constrain or potentially detect uh, new parameters in quantum field theory in our world. One example that is a lot of fun that came out of SITP is that if there are light fields that we are basically hidden from us, we can't see them except through gravity, in the presence of these rotating black holes that are observed in nature with a particular spectrum of very light masses for these scalar fields, they would have an effect on the dyna dynamics of the black holes. For example, they could spin them down and remove certain windows of possible angular momentum in the spectrum of black holes. So in some sense, the spectrum of black holes uh, is related to the spectrum of fundamental fields in the universe. Um, there's a lot more to say about that, uh, but let me leave it there. In the early universe, um, one of the most pleasant surprises in my own professional career is that the, the uh, data that we have fits beautifully with this theory of the origin of structure that I mentioned, and that's a, such a solid foundation that it allows us to then use that to test for much more fine-grained information about what may have been or may not have been going on uh, in the very early universe in terms of 
uh, not just this uncertainty principle, but the interactions of the fields that were operating back then um, and their potential gravitational wave emission, as well as rare events like the possibility that some black holes may be primordial, something that our, our session chair is into, for example. So there's a lot in this area. Um, but as I said, I'm going to mainly focus on the thought experimental side of the subject. Um, and there, let's bring together the classical and the quantum and build up to some really exciting new developments in these areas. So one observation, I'm still speaking a little bit historically, uh, back in the 1970s, gravitational physicists noticed an intriguing correspondence between the familiar equations of thermodynamics, which say, for example, that the change in energy of a box of gas can be is equal to the temperature times the change in entropy minus PdV plus mu dn and so on, and then entropy increases. That turns out to mirror very precisely what was found by these gravitational physicists to describe certain laws that describe the evolution of systems of black holes. Their total horizon area kept always increasing, you can prove that, and the change in their mass followed a similar law where the role of entropy was again played by area and so on. So there's this apparent relationship between entropy, which in statistical mechanics is really a count of available states, and the area of a classical gravitational horizon. Um, and on top of that, there's entropy also in the quantum fields living on this space time, as I, as I described already earlier. And in some of the modern work, in fact, this interplay is going to be important. So I'm going to, in fact, go straight to some of the most exciting news and take this observation that is quite old. And what it suggests is that there indeed should be some sort of statistical mechanical interpretation, not just a coarse-grained thermodynamics, but a statistical mechanical interpretation. It suggests that despite the fact that in the black hole it looks like you can have a continuum of possible states, they really should be quantized. It should be discrete. It should be like a material made of atoms. So we should have some sort of structure of atoms in space-time. And indeed, one finds this to hold in you know, several senses. Let me list two on this slide, and we'll continue. So one can take our leading theory of quantum gravity, which is string theory, and ask the question, <laughs> can you count the available states in a black hole? And in certain very special, highly symmetric cases, the answer has been known for quite a while, several, a couple decades now, to be, to be yes. And this kind of count of states has gotten extremely sophisticated in many different kinds of such examples, relating even to very sophisticated number of theoretic counts. So uh, things like partition functions. If you read the book about Ramanujan's life or saw the movie, you were introduced to the notion of a partition function. And this kind of thing indeed enters into counting as states of black holes in string theory. And it keeps just working on the node as a, as a precise count. But there's this issue of, you know, how do you see the quantization of the energy levels? That's a really big thing that is missing in the classical description. And in, in a tour de force work within our group uh, as well recently, they formulated the world's simplest example of a gravitational system, which has this question inside of it. And they made the calculation of this. Um, what I'm flashing here is a kind of processed function that relates to this discrete set of energy levels, and they were able to calculate very refined information about the statistics of those energy levels, um, essentially showing how, in this model, atoms of space-time indeed emerge. So, in more general circumstances, the way we think about space-time and its quantum nature is through what is called holographic duality. So there's this realization that entropy is like area, and that suggests 
that there's some kind of description of gravity that lives on an area known volume. And indeed, there's a very precise version of that known as the ADS CFT correspondence, where a certain quantum gravity system, um, it happens to be in a situation with a negative, not positive cosmological constant, um, can, can be understood very precisely to be equivalent to a theory that lives in one less dimension and doesn't in itself have gravity. So it's a, instead a quantum field theory, a certain kind of quantum field theory, a conformal field theory, in the most symmetric case that lives to be a little uh, poetic on the boundary of the space. Um, and that idea that there's degrees of freedom living on the boundary of a bulk space-time uh, will permeate the rest of the talk and will extend beyond this, this uh, simplest case. So, but the general idea here is that space-time is an emergent idea, that in fact uh, there are fundamental degrees of freedom that are not um, endowed with a space-time interpretation from the start, but that that emerges when it should. Um, and these degrees of freedom are necessarily very strongly interacting, but there's a lot of evidence that this duality is true. Now, there is a lot of evidence. Nobody doubts it. Nonetheless, the precise dictionary is not fully understood, and there's been a lot of uh, mini breakthroughs <coughs> recently in, uh, in rectifying that. This goes under the name of bulk reconstruction, and it impinges on this famous black hole integration problem. Another obvious flaw here is that for 20 years we've known that the cosmological constant is positive, that's how gravitation works in our, in our universe. And furthermore, I want to stress that in our leading theory of quantum gravity, this negative cosmological constant system is extremely special. It's not how the theory normally behaves. Normally it has positive energy to drive <coughs> expansion of the universe, um, and it's very, very easy to see that. So in order to understand both reality and quantum gravity, we must treat this case as well. So um, I will spend the rest of the talk on these two items and summarize some progress. How am I, how are we doing? Uh, okay. Um, okay, so we want to reconstruct the bulk of space-time. Now there are basically three ways we know how to do that. One is that you think about the fields of this quantum field theory and you have this emergent dimension that's supposed to appear and what that um, relates to is the motion on the space of field strengths in that theory. And indeed, you find that if you look at the strongly interacting quantum field theory, and you ask about how fields move um, in strength as a function of time, whereas if the, if the theory were weakly coupled, the field could change in time however it wants. It would be pretty unconstrained. It could move change in time very rapidly. But lo and behold, in the correct kind of strongly interacting theory, instead, the interactions conspire to stop the field from moving faster than a certain value. Um, and that value corresponds to the speed of light in the emergent bulk dimension. This is actually my favorite way of probing the bulk, but uh, more of the recent progress has happened in other ways. So, one thing you can do is to start on the boundary of the system, throw stuff in and collect it again, roughly speaking. And you find that if you want to probe further and further into the bulk, that kind of smears out what you need to capture on the boundary. And there's this general relation that, as basically because of this, uh, the middle of the space time away from the boundary is kind of the more low energy, long distance uh, part of the theory. And conversely, and the state of the system becomes more complex to describe as you go further in. Um, now, most recently, probably the most powerful and far-reaching method of reconstruction involves quantum entanglement. So here, I've drawn the system at a certain time. It's divided the boundary into two regions, R and the complement R bar. And for some reason, I've drawn a surface in here with an area, and that is defined to be the minimal area that can go from a point on the boundary to, to the other end point of this interval R. <coughs> Although that's not really how it's defined, actually. It's defined by minimizing not just the area, but actually the entanglement. Um, 
that includes an area term, but also the entanglement of the quantum field on the geometry. So before I, I had a, such a formula when it came to the area, uh, the entropy of, of these black holes where there was an area term and then there was quantum entanglement on top of that. We have that here as well. And you can probe into the bulk using this so-called extremal surface or ultimately quantum extremal surface. Um, and that turns out to be a very, very conceptually useful way of doing it. The calculations get rather impractical, but it's conceptually very useful. Um, one theme that you may have heard of is that highly entangled states in a strongly interacting theory uh, relate or correspond to space-time that is, that is knit together as opposed to a more wildly fluctuating quantum space-time foam sort of thing. We've seen that in certain generalizations of ADS-CFT and also more recently in the positive cosmological constant case as well. So the black hole information problem, let's come back to that. There, given this duality, there was an immediate conclusion that actually black hole evaporation is, is unitary. You can't lose information given the duality. Um, and this is the basis on which Hawking himself conceded that point. But it doesn't explain at all how that manages to happen because, again, the Hawking calculation looks featureless and doesn't seem to preserve the information. Um, now, that problem still uh, evades a full solution, but there's a beautiful new insight into how ADS-CFT is consistent with information uh, preservation, which has to do with the entanglement structure that I keep talking about. So one way to say it is that if the information is to come out, then the state of all the radiation that comes out had better be rich enough, it better have enough entanglement within itself to carry the information about what formed the black hole. Um, if it instead stayed totally correlated with what was inside uh, the black hole, then, and that is what Hawking's calculation says, is that that entropy continues to grow, then you wouldn't have information retrieval. And it turns out that if you take this uh, business of entanglement, um, uh, minimal surface reconstruction, uh, and you ask what happens to this entanglement, you find that because of the interplay of the classical quantum pieces, in fact, the entropy does what it must do in order to preserve information. And that is a very recent result. Um, I'm not putting any names here because there are so many, but this was a single author paper by one of our students that actually uh, was independent of a several author paper of some more senior people, so we're particularly proud of this one. And it's um, leading to a lot of interesting discussion. However, we still don't really understand how the information transfers in the sense of what goes beyond the Hawking calculation, particularly. Okay, let me finish by uh, my own favorite development of late, which is addressing this issue of the cosmological concept, which is in fact positive. And you know, all this stuff about black hole entropy being area and holography has nothing to do with anti desider space. It has to do with the area theorems in black holes. And in fact, what we found recently, long story short, is that we can, I, we can articulate a deformation of the CFT that changes the boundary theory to produce one which is appropriate to describe a bulk that is instead a de Sitter as opposed to an anti de Sitter with positive cosmological constant. Um, and this is one of those things that developed in a surprising way from some results of some other group involving quantum field theory that is uh, controllable when you deform a system in a way that affects its high energy physics, which is normally difficult to do, but this group was able to do that. And we found that if you do that, so you affect the high energy part of the system in a calculable way, that uh, turns out to, in fact, excise the unnatural boundary of the anti de Sitter space. And that's going in the right direction, but it turns out that if you then combine that calculable uh, deformation that affects the high energy physics with one that simultaneously affects the low energy physics in a very simple way. Uh, you can morph the bounded region of this ADS 
uh, gravity all the way to a bounded region of the finite um, space of a positive co cosmological constant system. So uh, this is something that we're madly pursuing these days in SITP as well. There we've begun importing lessons from anti Sitter CFT correspondence to this deformed business, including the entanglement uh, reconstruction ideas. And one thing that permeates both cases, another result of some young people coming out of our group is, it's known as quantum error correction, where certain points that you want to reconstruct in the bulk are, are protected if you just erase part of the boundary. And it turns out that, first of all, that's a beautiful feature of ADS-CFT in the first place, and it survives in a, in a somewhat reduced form in a more realistic case. Um, so I think I'm out of time. Let me just flash these conclusions. This subject of horizons, both black hole and cosmological, is <coughs> extraordinarily rich. They are generic in gravity. Um, they form under the least provocation. They lead to observational consequences, including the origin of all structure in the universe. Um, they lead to phenomenological opportunities and also major challenges <coughs> in quantum gravity. Um, that's what I focused on, and we're having a lot of fun with various threads of research that are really making progress, and hopefully they will come together nicely um, as we proceed. Um, I also want to say that you know, I couldn't do justice to any of these one things, either to what they have accomplished in these different areas, as well as the caveats, the subtleties, of which there are many. Um, so again, I invite you to come up to SITP and discuss with us. Computer just went to sleep. Just okay, okay. Wake up your computer. Is it going? Yeah. Okay. Should be okay. going. Okay, great. Thanks. Uh, well, thanks very much for the opportunity to tell you a little bit about astrophysics and, and black holes. Um, I'm uh, uh, going to compliment Eva's uh, book, and I'll start off a little bit of history here. Uh, spherical black holes uh, were uh, first proposed in some sense by John or Joni Mitchell uh, in the late 18th century, uh, tell the difference, um, and uh, the German soldier Karl Schwarzschild in the First World War um, uh, gave the solution which Eva actually showed for a purely spherically symmetric black hole. He didn't realize, and many people didn't realize at the time, what was what he wanted to discover, but that's in fact what it was. It was a mathematical solution to the equations. Um, so what, what this really showed in some sense was that black holes can exist. Now, if we think about it from an astronomical point of view, there are two types of compact stars that were known around this, uh, known uh, about the United States, with the, the white dwarfs, which were about the size of the Earth, and the neutron stars, which are about the size of uh, Palo Alto, and Chandrasekhar showed that there's a maximum mass to the white dwarf, and Robert Oppenheimer, working here in California, and his students showed that there was a maximum mass to the neutron star. So what that meant was that if astronomy tried to make a star that was compact, was bigger than any of this, you had no alternative but to make a black hole. I'm like, telling you simplifying a story, so we know that from an astronomical point of view, because this happens in astronomy, uh, black holes really must exist. And then the third part of the, if you like, of the early history was actually observing these, and uh, although in the 1960s people were in fact looking at black holes, and some, some people thought they might be, but they weren't really sure, but the real proof came uh, with X-ray astronomy and the X-ray binaries where you found compact objects 
which were heavier than the maximum mass of the neutron star on the white wall, and you weighed this just by using Kepler's laws, and so in that case, you found that you saw an accretion disk, you saw the black hole, and black, you've got the argument that black holes really do exist observationally, and now we know we're, they're all over the place. Okay, so uh, from, a, from a classical physics point of view, uh, this in fact is the same equation that Eva showed, although it looks different, and it basically says that curvature is equal to stuff, and uh, this was, of course, Albert Einstein, who unified space and time, and re related the curvature of it to the matter that was there, and then said that that... Um, uh, the, matter, the, the matter actually followed uh, uh, simple rules in that curved space-time. So it's a very unifying theory of gravity displacing Newton's theory. Now, you might say, well, this is only just a theory, but that isn't really so, because we have a lot of measurement and validation of the general theory. Now, I'll just distinguish uh, the weak field case, that is when we're dealing with things like the solar system, where we think it's moving speeds much less than the speed of light. And in that case, we can do tests and look for differences which we can measure between what general relativity and Albert Einstein say and what a strict Newtonian would say. And in every case, uh, Einstein wins. The effects are small, but measurable. And in some cases, they're measurable to 10 parts per million. That's 10 to the minus 5. All right? So another way of doing this is to use pulsars, neutron stars, and uh, I'll come to those again, but when they, they were observed first in 1974, and when they're in orbit about each other, they're wonderful clocks moving in the gravitational field. It's like a test, it's like a homework problem, uh, but it's in reality, and you can measure the arrival times of the pulsars from these regular clocks, and you can see the orbits decrease under the action of gravitational radiation. A lot of other effects that are predicted by the general theory of relativity. And here are two rather nice diagrams. This is a prediction of the, uh, how the period of, orbit, of the orbit of two neutron stars about each other uh, evolves with time. It's been measured very, very carefully, extraordinary techniques by radio astronomers. And the other same sort of crew of people have been measuring these other effects and just to cut a long story short, there's, these are all parameters here which you can measure using observations. And if Einstein's right, all of these lines should pass through a point. And what you see here is a blow up of that region there. And within the areas which are impressively small, all of those lines do pass through a point. So again, Einstein is checking out just fine, uh, and this is about the level of about 100 parts per million, 10 to the minus 4. So this is a pretty good weak field test of general relativity. And the thing that's happened recently, both from sort of indirect observations using X-ray astronomy, but also, as I'm going to come to, gravitational radiation, is that you're seeing strong field relativity when the escape velocity is, if you like, close to the speed of light. You're seeing that affirmed by observation and measurement. But the, you can, there's no real way to quantify this, but certainly at the 10% level, and if you make rather more specialized claims, you can do much better than that. Um, another part of it, I just mentioned this parenthetically here, it's not really part of my story in black holes, is that general relativity rests on a thing called the equivalence principle, and uh, uh, my, my colleague Mark Kasovich here has, um, has uh, experiments, one of them you can see around here, where he uses uh, atom interferometry, this is a quantum mechanical effect, to test the principle of equivalence, and uh, I'll come back to this in a moment, uh, there he is, be happy, must expect it must have worked, there we go. So let's go back to the black holes now, uh, here's just a, if you like, uh, the uh, a cartoon of what happened in the night, in, in, ten, in, a, in a glorious decade of discovery from 1963 to 1973, Roy Kerr uh, discovered the, uh, the metric which shows his name, there it is there, uh, and then uh, it was just a, 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 a solution to the general theory of relativity, um, people, but people eventually realised that although it was describing a black hole, it was really describing the black hole. 
And uh, the work that we did, this was involved many people. There were three schools. The, the American School of Princeton was uh, led by John Wheeler, who was a lecturer of, who, whose claim to have coined the phrase black hole. In fact, he wasn't the first one to use it, but I think he did it independently. And then there's Roger Penrose and Stephen Hawking, whom you have made. And one of the important formulae here, which I will, it's any other formula I'll show, but it's one that is key to what I have to say, is that if you look at the mass of a black hole, you can distinguish a mass that would be measured by an orbiting planet from what I call an irreducible mass. And the difference between the mass measured by a planet and the irreducible mass is the mass associated with the rotation. And these general black holes are ones that are spinning, and there is mass, and E equals mc squared, so there's energy associated with them, and that energy is extractable. And they can power cosmic phenomena. And that's a key point I'd like you to uh, take away with you. So that is the, uh, um, the story here, is that as a result of all of this work done over that glorious decade, we learned, which is probably as much as you need to know for astronomy, uh, that um, black holes are very simple. As far as astronomy is concerned, they're defined just by mass and spin. No more, no less, just mass and spin. That's all we need for astronomy. But it also, and I want to make this point very clearly, is that it set the stage for the glorious theoretical physics that Eva and her colleagues have gone on to investigate and investigate to this day. This was, in some sense, the foundation, and they've gone off in this area of theoretical physics, which is still a, a, a great story, but for astronomy, that's all we need, really. So if we look at black holes in astrophysics, we really have two main types. One is the stellar black holes, which have masses uh, I would say, and I'll explain why I say three here, three to a hundred solar masses roughly, so three to a hundred times the mass of the sun, those are the stellar black holes. Uh, they're made, we know, in supernova explosions, probably a minority of them, probably one in a few of the thousand maybe, of supernova explosions, leave behind black holes. And we see the, um, the births of these uh, black holes probably in the form of astronomical a cosmic phenomena called gamma ray bursts, which happened about one a day observed throughout the universe. We didn't think about one, one a day, and these gamma ray bursts are basically the birth prize, if you like, of, of black holes. Um, it's possible that there are other black these black the black holes that we're seeing, it's possible that some of them are uh, refugees from the very early universe, but most astronomers believe that they're made more or less in the contemporary universe but that's very much a work in progress. The second type of, of black hole that we observe commonly astronomically is, is the massive black hole, and these are between 1 million to 10 billion times the mass of the sun. And they reside in state in the centers and nuclei of galaxies. So they sit in the middle of, of galaxies, there's this black hole sitting right there, and uh, most galaxies worth the name have a black hole sitting in their centre. We already know that. And uh, we are, when they are fed, or activated in some way, then we observe them as active galactic nuclei, or in their most spectacular form, quasars. The quasars are the bright uh, nuclei of galaxies that can outshine their host galaxies by factors of a hundred or a thousand. So they were called quasi-stellar because it took a lot of effort, I'll show this in a moment, to actually find these the galaxies around them, and now we know they're there, but, so they just look like stars, but in practice they are just the nuclei in the tiny regions in the centres of galaxies, rather like atoms have nuclei in their centres. Now there are other types of black holes for which we have observational evidence in astronomy. I'm not going to belabor the point. The evidence is not as yet that good, but it's suggestive and a longer talk would then go to some of these other possibilities where we might, might have been observing a broader class of black holes. But these are the two main ones that we know about. So let's just talk about some of this. Uh, firstly, um, we shouldn't be ashamed of our galactic nucleus. It has a rather small black hole. That's what it looks like uh, optically. It has, uh, you wouldn't want to live next to a quasar, believe me. Um, so, um, so this is what it looks like in X-rays. And then what I hope I can activate here. Well, this has a, doesn't always work. Oh, it does. Okay. So this is. This may look like a simulation, but it isn't. This is observations of stars 
of orbiting the black hole in our galactic centre, just like planets orbit the sun. And just like planets orbiting the sun, we can measure the mass of the sun, so we can also measure the mass of the black hole. And it works out to be four million solar masses, as I say, and in the great scheme of things, a rather pathetic one, but um, don't be ashamed. It, you don't want to live it. You may have noticed the, the keen eye may have seen this going on to the future. Uh, that is actually a prediction. Um, but so far, this prediction has worked out just fine. And we're starting to do a lot more with the orbits of these stars and learning about relativity from it. Okay, so that, oh, that's already gone. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about how to get power out of black holes, which Peter Michelson alluded to. Here's our good friend Sisyphus, and that's just as a simple experiment. Uh, let him roll his 10 ton boulder up a 100 meter hill. I think that's about what he had to do for a living, and then watch it roll down the hill. It's not. Some of you may empathise with this guy, I don't know. Um, but anyway, so that's a release of a certain amount of energy. It's the equivalent of three kilograms of TNT, 300 grams of gasoline or alcohol or choose your poison, um, 100 micrograms of uranium, and 300 nanograms of accreting gas onto a black hole, anything accreting onto a black hole. Taking out the garbage, throw it down the black hole, it's just fine. So accreting gas in this, it releases about a tenth of mc squared. E equals mc squared. Again, E equals mc squared. You get about a tenth of that mc squared energy out, much about a you know, hundred times what you might get out from a nuclear reactor, for example. So, there's a solution. Um, just catch a black hole. Okay, so the second channel you've got, as I emphasize, is the mass that resides in the spin. And if you spin up a black hole as fast as you can, then, uh, and we can measure how fast they are in many cases using X ray astronomy, and they appear to be, many of them appear to be quite close to the maximum ang uh, angular velocity that they could have. Then, if you could do that, then the energy that's available is up to 0.3 of mc squared, 30% of mc squared. And what you actually extract, though, is probably with typical inefficiencies and so on, closer to what you get in gravitational energy, the 10 mc squared, that's going to be typical perhaps for a spinning black hole. Um, there is, of course, a lot of uh, energy released, but some of it is released outside the black hole, outside the event horizon, and some of it is released inside the event horizon, which is uh, that sort of curtain discreetly removes all this um, uh, all this dissipation that's going on behind, behind, behind the curtain. Okay, so, so let's talk about first the spin power there. That's the thing I was, I was going to sort of emphasize here because it has a relevance to where I'm taking this talk. This is Michael Faraday, and there's his wheel. And as many of you recall, as physicists, uh, if you spin a magnetic field, it induces an electromagnetic. Uh, with a conductor, you induce, which a black hole is, you induce a, an electromotive force, and if you go through the sort of Ohm's Lory sort of analysis here, then the voltages that you'll get will be about a zeta volt. For those who aren't, uh, don't see this on display in the hardware store, that's 10 to the 21 volts, that's an awful lot of energizer bunnies, and then 10 uh, X amps associated with it, and the product of those two will give you a power, which is enough for a brilliant quasar. So that's the way this basically works in, in outline, and uh, that's a simulation, why stop there? Uh, but we will, won't, we'll go on to observations, and so what we see is, um, here this is the first quasar ever discovered, 3C273, it's brighter than trillion suns, and there with great effort you've blocked out the quasar, the nucleus of that galaxy, and uh, there you see the galaxy around it, but what this has here is not just a, a black hole smaller than our solar system. That black hole is smaller than our solar system, surrounded by a disk, just like the X-ray binaries. And then it also creates, as these structures often do, a structure called a jet. So we've got a black hole, a disk, like that, and then two jets perpendicular to the disk. That's a typical geometry that you see. You'll see more examples of this in a moment. So that's the first quasar. Here's Fermi Gamma Ray uh, Space Telescope. Um, this was an uh, a, a, a initiative that really grew, it was an international collaboration, it grew out of Stanford. Very proud to have been a member of it, Peter Michelson, 
uh, was the leader of this, is the picture of him before he became a dean, and, uh, <laughs> and it's been gloriously successful, and, um, uh, and one of the things that it did, one of the many, many discoveries that it made, was he looked at uh, another quasar, one like we to seven three, and found that the gamma rays from this enormously powerful machine there, this black hole, are varying within three minutes if you're in the frame of that, of that, of that black hole. They can vary as fast as three minutes. And you, so this is at least confirmation that you're looking at something that is very, very compact, that's producing more power than 100, 100 galaxies right in the centre. So this is an extraordinary thing, it's a billion solar mass black hole, it's spinning, and uh, this, is the, this is the data which shows that variation in the gamma rays, which came from the Burberry Gamma Ray Space Telescope. So let's go on to the next um, uh, uh, thing in which there is a strong local interest, and that is the detection of gravitational radiation. Again, very much involved in the black hole business, as you know, I'm sure, uh, the uh, LIGO project is now combined with the Virgo project in Europe. There are two detectors in the United States and one in Italy. And uh, here's Bob Beyer, who, uh, in my days at Caltech, he was always known as the laser... I don't know whether Bob's here or not, but he was always known as the laser guy. And, uh, and he was the guru, and I think, it, and the, from the very start of LIGO, he was a person who uh, was known to be able to make the lasers that they would need work. And so he's a sort of great part of Stanford's a great part of this story. And the present, um, uh, there's, a, there's several people, Mark, Mark Fayer and so on. Here's a picture of Brian Lance, a reason I'll come to in a moment. And uh, uh, Stanford still has a lot, large program in LIGO, which we should be very proud about. And going forward, one's looking to a larger network of detectors and making more and more sen making proof sensitivity and more and more detection. So this was the first binary black hole that was discovered. Um, it's not actually an image of it, uh, but it's a simulation, but it's one that's fiducial. And what you're actually looking at here is a background star field, as you would see if you had an optical telescope looking at it. And you'll see this thing merge. And this, this is, a, this is a, a, a simulation of the event that was the very first binary black hole in 2015, and a very exciting time that was, because a lot of people have been waiting 30 or 40 years for that. Um, here's the other type of black, binary black hole that was seen in, that, in those early days, in 2017. This was two neutron stars coalescing. What would have happened to the binary pulsars discovered in 1974 in 230 million years, and what we see here is again is a reconstruction of the actual signal that's down here, and you can see the two neutron stars. Then they merge, and they uh, give you. Um, we most of us believe they give you a uh, a black hole and uh, uh, what's left over. Though that's not absolutely sure as yet. So that would be a three solar mass black hole if that is the case. So the official the official story for these. Uh, this is this is a thing that's made, and they always think about this in sort of um, uh, eschatological ways. The, the masses in the stellar graveyard, they call it. I like to think of this as a birth. This is a birth of a black hole. This is a new, bright new beginning. So, anyway, uh, the official story here from the LIGO collaboration, Brian Mance gave me this an hour ago, is the official story, of course, is the same as what they've actually validated, which is 10 binary black holes and one binary neutron star. Since then, there's been another large run, and what you do in these runs is you have, because you need follow-up, you need to be able to look at the um, events to see if you can see anything in the rest of the electromagnetic spectrum, and that indeed is what happened with the, uh, with the neutron stars, the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope, was a key part of the story of making the identification. And uh, if we take a reasonable projection from the public alerts that have gone out there that are not yet fully validated, then we're looking already at 21 of these binary black holes, three binary neutron stars, and three neutron star uh, black hole. But Brian would want me to issue a government health warning with these. Uh, it's possible that some of this may have to be retracted as we learn more about them. 
but it's been a very exciting time and clearly the sensors are going up, the detection rates are going up and we're going to learn a lot more and discover a lot more. So we see you know, two black holes with masses up to uh, 30 solar masses or so uh, combining uh, to make a, a black hole with mass slightly less than the sum of the constituent masses and that difference is the energy carried away by gravitational waves that are measured by LIGO, Virgo and the other telescopes. One of the things you can do with the neutron stars is the, um, uh, we now see that these are common events and they can account for a puzzle in cosmic nucleosynthesis, the production of heavy elements, and it now looks that these features, that the merging neutron stars, you can see on the left here, these elements here could well be made in this environment. Don't trust all the details here, but do note that the, if you like jewellery, the gold and the platinum uh, and the silver are all made in this environment, and if you only like get cheap jewellery, the zirconium comes from a lower class environment. <laughs> uh, so, okay, yeah, never mind. Okay, so, uh, finally, uh, finally, uh, those who haven't emerged from a coma will know that the Event Horizon Telescope, uh, uh, oh yeah, I know I showed that, uh, maybe we should go back, uh, uh, the Event Horizon Telescope, um, uh, by combining telescopes all around the globe, was made, able to make an image of one black hole in the galaxy M87, a nearby Asta. Uh, that this was uh, Bob Wagoner, who's here in the audience, uh, long ago made images of what they should see. Um, they were pretty good. The, the, the telescope was trying to catch up with him, but uh, that's what they actually saw, of course. But you know, he even got the colours right. Um, so he knows, he knows the colours are a millimetre. Photons. Okay, um, so anyway, M87 is a close by cluster of galaxies um, it, and it has uh, six, this is six billion, not million, six billion solar masses. Uh, its size is, uh, this is light travels in nine hours, uh, it's a big black hole therefore, and it's four micro arc seconds. Think about that, that's what these radio astronomers are grappling with. And it has jets associated with it that are not seen here. But this was a wonderful, iconic image and a tremendous um, the technical accomplishment to pull this off. Just to be clear about the jets, this is what the centre of the galaxy looks. This is what the galaxy looks like. We've got jets coming out in opposite directions. You can see them here. These are the jets observed on smaller and smaller scales, like in Trusco, where about a million in scale astronomers can do this sort of imaging now. And there in the centre is the ring around the black hole. And the bit in the middle, that's the shadow. That's what they call the shadow of the black hole. Okay, that's the bit where the light gets absorbed. Okay, so what I've tried to do in this very brief summary is just give you a little bit of a flavour. What is a very active area of research right now? There's a lot going on. We're learning about black holes and all that they impact. Uh, they must, they can, must, and do exist. They're described from an astronomer's point of view, not through the feline imaginings of theoretical physicists, but just from what you actually observe by mass and spin. And the, uh, they have gravitational and rotational energy that can vary in minutes, even the massive black holes. And we've seen the gravitational waves from the merging binaries, and now we've got direct observations of the region around a black hole for the first time, like looking at atoms for the first time. And watch the space time because it's a lot more coming. Thank you very much indeed. So I think the first question, should I flip a coin? Either you... Yes, you can flip a coin. Yeah, okay, I'll ask my time to ask you Right, right, okay. As you can first. Um, one of the, uh, I'd just like to ask quick questions. One of the things that um, had had a lot of publicity uh, were the firewalls around black holes, and these are essentially a quantum mechanical paradox, and they could, in principle, have impacted the observations that I've just discussed. What is the present state of play in those firewalls? It's really another name for the information loss problem, and the fact is we don't have a complete solution of that, so I can't definitively answer your question. It's a great, it's a great question. It's, it's, um, there's, in order to answer that, one has to understand how the Hawking calculation gets modified strongly enough to, to bring the information out. Um, and given that it has to work differently from Hawking's calculation, the firewall people argued that, what they were arguing is that Hawking's calculation emerged from a smooth horizon, and it was what it was. It was, it was this feature was radiation. 
Um, and conversely, if you don't have featureless radiation, well, they argue that that must have come, this is very rough, but they argue that must have come from something other than a smooth horizon. Um, now, if they were here, they would say, even if that's true, and nobody uh, knows, that nobody you know, has understood the full you know, conclusion of this whole information loss problem, um, but they would say, even if that's true, it need not be, it, it could be so close to the horizon that you, you know, you, it's it wouldn't be any good it, it, Yeah, because of the redshift. Now, it could be, however, that what accounts for that difference is something like string theory, which has very non-local effects. And in that context, there's no reason to believe it is uh, sequestered right at the horizon um, within a, a Planck distance. And so one of our due diligence calculations going on um, now is to really figure out what string theory has to say about this. And it's a, it's a complicated thing, but it's ongoing. So there is progress. This business of the entropy in the ADS-CFT correspondence doing what it needs to do you know, is, is a new result. Uh, but there's still this question of exactly how the information transfers and what was wrong with Hawking's calculation. OK. Eva, how about you have the next question? Well, OK, so with this um, Event Horizon Telescope image, I gather there's been a lot of discussion of exactly where is the emission coming from? What is it probing about the curve of the rotating black hole? Um, there's a photon ring. There's an actual event horizon. Uh, there's an ergosphere. You know, what is it that there's an accretion disk, which is very rich around the thing. Where is the emission coming from? What is it really telling us? OK, you probably asked the wrong question, the wrong person that question, because I only have heretical views on what is actually observed. The, the, the party lies. And, we, and, the, and the event horizon people deserve this. The party line is that they're observing a ring of hot uh, 100 MeV ions in protons in orbit around the black hole with 10 MeV electrons, which are radiating synchrotron radiation. That's what they're looking at. Um, my heretical view, uh, which I won't belabor, but is that in fact that's not the case. What they're actually looking at is a magnetosphere, a magnetically dominated environment rather like one sees around a neutron star, or indeed in the Earth, which has its magnetosphere. And I, I call it an ergo-magnetosphere in celebration of the ergosphere, which is the famous structure around a curved black hole. And uh, I would say that that's actually what you're looking at. And that, uh, in fact, sort of even more uh, radically, I would say that the spin of the black hole not only is powering all that emission, but it's actually driving away the gas uh, that would otherwise accrete onto it. So in fact, they're not accretion disks, but ejection disks. But that's, that's my own view of what's happening from that. But the, whatever the outcome is, this is an extraordinary technical achievement to pull off this, 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 this uh, image. OK, open for questions. Yes? Uh, I have a question for Roger. Um, which one came first, the galaxies or the supermassive black holes at their centers? Um, this is the fundamental question of developmental biology, which came <laughs> first, uh, the galactic chicken or the black hole egg. Um, and the answer is somewhat similar. They co-evolved. Okay, so I mean, it's a good question, and people have asked that, and there were alternative explanations. But what we're basically seeing is one isn't the, you know, the seed of the other, as it were. They really grew together. And in fact, galaxies, particularly the elliptical galaxies, have major mergers in their past, and the black holes may well have uh, combined as well. Um, and you know, they will be sources a very long way to make other gravitational radius in a longer way than we see here. Next question. Uh, yes. For the past couple of decades, the constraints that have eliminated black holes from consideration as dark matter are based on the assumption of a monochromatic mass, which is appropriate for particles, but not for a population of merging bodies, let alone a broadly, uh, a wide uh, mass distribution. And now that uh, the LIGO-Virgo uh, population is <laughs> in one of the uh, areas that is not constrained by these monochromatic uh, um, mass distribution constraints. Uh, is there any hope for particle dark matter? Does it, does it have any more leg to stand on? Okay, let's take the first part of that question. The, 
the bl all black holes, but the dark matter, they certainly qualify by being dark, but I think not. Um, the, uh, there is now, it isn't just one mass, there's a range of possible masses that are effectively limited by astronomical observation. Some are obviously better than others, but my own view is, which is the majority, is the majority opinion, is that the, all of the dark matter cannot be in the form of black holes. Uh, one percent might be, that's, that's still allowed by astronomers, but if you say all of it isn't now. So is there any hope for particle dark matter? I would say yes, it, it is in some sense the last hope. There are one or two other possibilities, but the astronomers have been, you know, party poopers, they've really ruled out most of the suggestions we've made. And what's left is a, a range of elementary particles uh, that are still allowed. And, you know, to me, they're the most likely possibility. And, I, and I'm kind of proud that many of my colleagues here at Stanford are pioneering sort of smaller, um, rapid, faster experiments to look at some of this much larger range of possibilities rather than the sort of very long-term experiments looking at in special possibilities. And I think that's, you know, some, you know, the most likely thing is they'll set up a limit like everybody else has, but there's a possibility that they, one of them will hit, hit on it, and I trust you, you'll hear about it. <laughs> yes. you know, I found your um, atoms of space-time very intriguing. Uh, the only thing I've seen in the public literature, or in the, just the popular mm -hmm. literature, has to do with triangulations of, of space-time. But how far have physicists gotten with uh, the different types of structures. You showed one that had three arms and something like a pretzel in the center. Uh, are there also uh, atoms of space-time conjectured or, or shown in, in theoretical calculations that are binary? Are there threes? Are there fours? Is there a periodic table that which you would expect it to come out of? So what you're seeing, that picture of the three-sided thing with a blob in the middle, right is part of this calculation that unfortunately is a little bit of a processed version of the energy levels. It's not directly a state of the system. Um, I didn't mean to give that impression. Uh, but what it is is a, a, so one way to process the energy spectrum is to consider a, a thermodynamic or statistical mechanical partition function. So sum over the states, exponential of minus one over the temperature, sometimes called beta, times the energies. And what that quantity was, was a um, combination of three of those which are correlated in this system um, in, as a result of this precise gravitational calculation. So, so first of all, that object, as I just described it, has information about the energy spectrum in it. And what that three-pronged thing was, was a, a correlation of three of those, uh, which relates to a equivalent description of the system as a, what's called a random matrix theory, a, a integral over a certain um, class of, of Hamiltonians, so energy have operators. Have calculations been done for, for two, of, two such options? Yeah, yeah, the, these, this group did the calculation for all such endings, um, and all that information gives a lot of information about the statistics of the energy levels themselves. Um, so, yeah, I hope that my simple description of trace over energy states uh, related to this. So I took on address that method. Yeah, yeah, so I hope, I hope that at least that you can get the gist of what I'm trying to so say. So how, how can, can you point me to a paper or an author? I can, just come down afterwards okay. and I'll, yeah. Okay. yeah. okay, time for one more question. Yeah. If I ask both of you to make a bet uh, that we will uh, detect uh, primordial black holes, where would you fall in on this question? And at what mass? <laughs> well, all right, fools rush in. Okay. Uh, nobody's listening, okay? I, I would say there's still a chance. I think it's less than 50% that the binary black hole, significantly less than 30 the binary black holes that LIGO has now maybe seen 21 of or so, and LIGO, Virgo, and so on, may have seen that, they are actually primordial in the sense that they're so-called population three stars, 
that are made in the, in the early universe. So that's in the early universe, that's when the very first stars happen. Um, uh, and so it's not you know, the very early universe. That, I think, is much harder. I think it's just physically much harder to do that. But the, the very first stars that are made have relatively low metals and are able to make binary black holes. I'd still give that a fighting chance of being the, the provenance of the binary black hole being the most of the LIGO sources. So that would be my answer. Right. Well, so obviously the conservative view is no unless absolutely proven otherwise. Um, but one thing that many of us have been interested in lately is just how generic is the phenomenon of the production of these black holes and at what abundance in quantum field theory. So forgetting about, you know, the phenomenological constraints for a moment and just asking what is reasonable from the point of view of quantum fields living on this expanding space-time? And it, this question is related to something interesting about that. So there's a probability distribution for these fluctuations. I mentioned the uncertainty principle, which is basically the, the Gaussian or normal distribution approximation to that distribution. But it's, it's in, in its full glory, it's going to be a non-Gaussian distribution. And so rather than being a normal distribution, it has some tails. And those tails can be rather heavy, we find, in quantum field theory, interacting quantum field theory. And so, you know, when I looked into this recently with a student, it seemed like a very reasonable possibility from that point of view. That doesn't mean it's realized in nature, but it's a, you know, it's a possibility worth exploring. If I had to bet, I would bet no, just to be conservative. But, you know, it's um, interesting. Actually, I want to turn it around to you and ask how puzzling are the supermassive early black holes. People in astrophysics seem to say it's hard to understand how those grew to their enormous size as quickly as they did. Is that a place where the primordial option might be appealing or is that um, too quick? Oh, uh, I would say not at all puzzling. Um, I think it's quite easy to build up the black holes by a variety of mechanisms faster than other people say, and I think it's, okay. it, it, it's not a great astrophysical puzzle, puzzle to assemble them in plenty of time. Okay. I think it's telling us something very important about the way galaxies evolve, that's a different matter, and perhaps the reheating of the, of the, of the universe at that time. Um, perhaps I could just add a, a small uh, parenthetic note to what you said about the you know, primordial black holes. I actually, uh, um, Yes, personal note, it was that uh, I, ha I had the office next to Stephen Hawking in 1974 when he was doing the, you know, his, his famous calculations on doing it in that polls, and I remember hearing about it you know, at the time, and it seemed to me such a beautiful result, I could not believe it was wrong. And those who did know about it, who didn't know about the people, were there, they were a bit mystified, and they were not so sure at all, but it was a bit rude. And then one of the things that you know, some of us did then at that time was to think about ways you could find them. And at that time, it was thought that they could explode. And if they exploded, they would make radio pulses and so on. And people, you know, people took this sufficiently seriously to go off and look for them. And of course, they never found anything. And we now, now believe that that's not what was going on. But I think, you know, one, so much of astronomy has been discovery of the unexpected. Right, right. No, it that, could have been. You know, you shouldn't listen to us. You should go off and look. <laughs> yeah, no, that's appropriate. Well, thank you, Roger. Thank you. Give me 10 to 1 odds, I'll bet on primary black holes. Oh, uh, yeah, we should have asked you what the, uh, yeah.